Welcome to another episode of Leadership Lessons. My guests today are Mason and Marina Shelton, and I'll tell you all about them in just a moment. But for now, Mason and Marina, welcome to Leadership Lessons. Thank you Thank for you. having us. Thank you for taking the time to join. So let me tell you about Mason and Marina. Mason was born and raised in Cadiz, Kentucky. Marina was born and raised in Shelbyville. Both grew up active in local Baptist churches. They met at Murray State University, go racers, through involvement with the Baptist campus ministry there. Mason has previously worked as the Discipleship Ministries Coordinator for Crossroads Fellowship in Cadiz and is now studying biblical counseling and missions at Southern Seminary, plans to return to full-time ministry once he finishes his degree. Marina has worked as the social media and website associate uh, at the KBC for three years. At this time, they're expecting their very first child shortly, and together they wrote a book called Transforming Trials, A Study Through James. And so let me ask you two some questions. Marina, tell us what inspired you to write Transforming Trials and why the topic of trusting God through trials is so important to you personally. Thanks, Dr. Gray. That's a great question. So Mason and I obviously love writing together, but there was never really a spark that had given us any inspiration to write something as, as lengthy as a book. Um, but it was last February, February of 2021, Mason and I were expecting our first child and suddenly lost the child through miscarriage. And it was a very unexpected and difficult season for us. Uh, obviously, you never expect to lose a child, but that started what was a really long and difficult recovery and grief journey. And so as we were processing through the loss and trying to figure out what it was that we should do next, we obviously saw a lot of counsel from believers from the local church. We were looking for comfort. We were looking for hope. And the number one source we turned to is God's word. And the book of James really was a comfort to us. So as we were reading the book of James, we were gleaning this wisdom that is so evident and clear in scripture about what God intends for us in times of trial. And Mason and I were sharing it together and we just thought, well, this is so good. We need to write down what we're learning. I mean, we're both in our early twenties. So obviously don't have a lifetime of experience of trials, but maybe there's something here that we can learn and cling on to for the rest of our lives. And let's write it down on paper. So that's what first inspired us to start writing it. And then it launched us into this journey of writing the book. And the book came out last November. And it's funny because the very day that we launched the book, we found out we were expecting for the second time. And I was wow. so overjoyed. I mean, I just thought this is the Lord's perfect ending to our story of, of hurt. This is going to be the end. And of course, as, as you can predict, that was not the end. And we lost that child as well. So it was the Lord really teaching us again, the very truths that we had written to ourselves in a way that we weren't expecting to have to learn a second time. Um, but those two instances were really what sparked us to write this book as a help to other people, but primarily to ourselves as we're just processing God's word in light of that. So I've, I've, I've read your book and highly recommend it. Um, Marina, my favorite quote is your quote where it says, it's hard not to judge, especially when you have sisters, which I just love, absolutely love that. It's But it's a great book. You all kind of work um, in an expository way through the book of James, give really good, helpful insights. And then you also have some people tell their stories of, of their own experience with, with trials. Uh, so thank you for writing the book, and I hope folks could pick it up and, and read it. Mason, what do you think uh, most Christian leaders misunderstand uh, or what the Christian leaders misunderstand the most about the role of trials in our lives? I, I think one thing that Christian leaders often miss is they view uh, trials as simply a thing to get over. Uh, they, they view them just as an obstacle to get over. And so I, I think what's often missing is is the, the category for God using those very obstacles to do something within us, all right? There's not just a problem that the gospel helps us to overcome, but that God has put those th things in there intentionally uh, so that we can grow deeper in understanding the, the, the gospel. Um, so I would, I, that's one thing, if I could just uh, implore cr cr Christian leaders, uh, don't hurry up to help your, your people through trials without trying to figure out what God may be trying to, to do with them. 
So treat your trial uh, less like an event, more like a season that you're that you're walking through and, and learn to walk with God through it. Um, Marina, what advice would you give to someone who's trying to live faithfully in the midst of a difficult a difficult loss like like you've had personally? It's a great question. Um, of course, the number one thing I would say is Jesus is the great comforter. And so he he's the one who knows our pain most intimately. And that that was a comfort to me just to be aware of, of course, even what Mason's saying about, you know, there's so much that we think of in a season of a trial, like what, why is this particular thing happening to me? What do I need to do to be faithful? And, you know, the key word there is faith, having faith in the Lord. And I think, of course, the advice would be seek the Lord through his word and through prayer. But I think it's also recognizing that sanctification is harder than what we maybe think sometimes, and that the solution is not as Mason was saying, to get over a problem. The Lord puts so much more value on our hearts being humbled before him and our hearts being sanctified before him than he does giving us that thing, no matter how good it might be, that thing that our trial is preventing. He's allowing that to happen so that our hearts can be more like his. And that was really hard for me because I felt like my heart was physically being scraped away at by the Lord just asking me to surrender some parts of myself that I never had before. So that's all part of learning to be faithful in trial. It doesn't come easily. And actually it's really painful to realize that learning to be faithful in those seasons is is gonna be a challenge, but persevering through reading God's word, persevering through prayer, through Christian friendships, all of those things were the biggest comfort to me. I mean, I think a lot of us view a trial like the flu. I just want to get over it and just want to feel better and and have this have this behind me. So it's a great insight that both of you have have come to. Uh, Mason, how would you answer the same question? How would you, someone comes to you and they're really going through a difficult time? How would you try to advise them or counsel them to just be faithful through that season? Yeah, just uh, to kind of put some more uh, de- de- definition to to what Marina said. Uh, you know, the key word there is to, is living faithfully, and so. Uh, you know, James does talk a lot about faith. There's a there's a whole section in there where he talks about faith and how our works interplay with with our 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 faith. Um, and when you boil faith down to its most basic element, it is belief. It is believing what God says about ourselves, about our circumstances, um, about Him, about others. So, um, what I would what I would advise people to 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 do, whether it's a biblical counseling type of of, of situation. One thing I want to I wanted to try to to do is to find out ways that that person might be uh, not not be, be believing God, or not believing God not believing God about what He says about the, themselves or, or their circumstances or, or or Him. But really, what are those ways that the enemy has worked in lies um, about what God has said is is true? And and that takes reading Scripture. That takes uh, having others around you to help point out those things. It can be hard to, to see them on, on your own. Um, but once you've identified them, it's going to the Lord and saying, here is the unbelief that I find in my heart. Help my unbelief. Unbe- be- and we see that in the, the Gospels. And when we plead that God, do, do, that he does this work within us, uh, he, he gives us grace. He gives us wisdom in those trials uh, to do the very thing that he has allowed those trials to be in our lives for. Uh, and that's, that is making us more and more like, like, like Jesus. So I would say um, to identify those, those areas of unbelief be, be, and then a submission and asking God uh, to, to create that or to, to bless us with that kind of, of faith by his grace. And Mason, what you just said, I, I remember part of your your study at Southern is biblical biblical counseling, and so helping folks to be honest about God. I'm having a hard time believing that you're good right now because of what's happened to me, but that's just part of confession. It's just part of the Christian life. We have to start where we are, and the Lord can help us get get past that. Well, th- thank you for that that counsel, Marina. I'm curious, um, not just one miscarriage, but two miscarriages. When the great desire of your heart is to have children, and of course you're expecting now, um, what did people say or do that was most helpful when you got that news, received that news about about miscarriage? That's a great question, and one that so many people have asked as we've processed through this time of grief. 
I would say the most helpful thing is just being having people be present, saying that they're praying for you and then following up, um, being there as an encourager and as a friend. Because what happens so often for anyone who faces any kind of loss, you have an overwhelming few weeks of a lot of people reaching out. And then there's a season where no one reaches out. And that's typically the time that you need the most encouragement. And it would mean so much to me when three months into the recovery, six months into it, I would have someone send me a text and said, I, I was just thinking about you today. I was praying for you or want to drop something by the house. Those are the things that are most helpful. And also those who had walked through that journey before sending books or resources that were really helpful, not just suggesting them, but going ahead and purchasing them for me. That gave me kind of at least a, a foundation to build upon. And it gave me people I knew were in my sphere and could talk to me about things. And this isn't really something that someone did, but something Mason and I decided to do personally was, uh, well, really as a couple, to take a trip, a getaway, just the two of us. Mm -hmm. And we went up to Michigan and we took a weekend, long weekend, and we just spent the weekend, the two of us processing through what we had just gone through. We cried together, we prayed together, we read scripture together, we just made space to grieve. And that was truly most helpful, is allowing the person, whoever the friend is that's going through a hard time, allow them space to grieve. And of course, on the flip side, the least helpful thing for us was people who might have, with good intentions, said, well, you know, you'll have another opportunity to have a child, or that's okay, you know, this is just you'll get over it, stuff like that, because the Lord doesn't guarantee us anything. This child in my womb right now is, is in my mind a miracle because the Lord doesn't intend us or doesn't guarantee us anything on this side of heaven. And it's just an encouragement to have someone to remind you of God's promises, but not guarantee something that he never guaranteed. And people mean well, they want to say helpful things, but I, I would I would think a statement like that, you could have other children, you're still very, very young, almost feels like a dismissal of the life of that, that child, that, that the two children that uh, that you two, that you miscarried. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because James even says, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't act like that, you know, what's going to happen to, 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 to tomorrow because you don't you know as you plan plan as and and even say with your own lips lord willing um and so those those kind of comments of oh it'll happen someday i'm i'm sure of it you are young um really it went further than the bible promises us and uh yeah you know you have you have you know god promised a a, a child to to Mary and promise a child to uh, to Sarah. I mean, there's all there's all kinds of biblical yeah. examples where God said you're going to have a child, but yeah. our names aren't in there. You no, know, we we right. aren't that that isn't a promise for us. He promises a lot of other things. I mean, God promises that He's with us, and He He promises that He will not for, for forget us. He promises that our good is 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 His in, in, in intention. So there's a lot of other promises that that we can cling to. But the promise of having a child is not one, and so uh, it does kind of create those kind of expectations of, well, if, if this promise isn't found in God's Word, but that's kind of what your expectations are, it, 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 can, it can just feel a lot, a lot weightier. Mason, I'm curious. You're, again, studying biblical counseling. You are a minister of the gospel. You've been involved in church ministry, and, and you will be, again, as you finish your studies. How did you try to uh, minister to your wife? How did you try to comfort Marina through this experience? Um, what did you find helpful as a husband? Uh, you, you've helped other people, and now it's in your own family. What did you do that was helpful? What did you, what did you learn about yourself that maybe, that maybe was not as, not as helpful? So after the first miscarriage, I give myself an F. Mm -hmm. um, I, it, I found. Is Marina shaking her head? <laughs> I, don't, I mean, it, it was not, a kind of. learning curve. <laughs> when yeah. I, when, we, when yeah. we first found out, I think it was the middle of a work day. So I was in in the in the just the the fold of of numbers and different things, and then we learned that we had the the uh, miscarriage. Yeah. So we come home, and I re re remember Marina going and laying on the, the bed. I kind of got her quieted down, and I'm like, well, I got work to do. So I went in the other room and just kept working. And then when I f found that I, as I processed that, going back, of I clung to 
just getting on with the next thing, just whatever the work is, whatever that is. And it often left Marina not feeling, you know, I wasn't there to, to, to support her. Sure. And so I vowed, okay, that I've learned, I cannot do that next time. And so the second time that the miscarriage happened, oh, I knew what I wasn't going to, to do. I wasn't going to go in there and work anymore. My work and hope can, can wait for another day. Uh, and just I've just spent a lot more time uh, with with her and found ways, you know, even just a personalized way that it meant to uh, that just how how to how to 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 comfort her and and you know oftentimes it's just laying next to her, you know, or or just uh, not really saying a whole lot or even hearing her as she pours her heart out, not trying to offer uh, any any solutions, but just to just to sit and listen. And so um, you know it was. In in some ways, having the the second miscarriage provided me an opportunity to fix or to to show my improvement on how I learned from my failures after the first time. So you're writing about sanctification in your your book on James, and and then you're getting to live out your sanctification and experience. Exactly right. So, something I've heard the two of you say that that means a lot is the ministry of presence. Romans twelve fifteen. Rejoice with those that rejoice. Weep with those that weep. And it seems like that meant a lot to both of you. And, and Mason, you experienced that as well. But I just want to also commend you or the grace of God in you that you had the, the, the wisdom to take a trip and get away for a couple of days. I mean, you guys are in your twenties. That's really a smart thing to do to just get some time away. So praise God for all he's already done in your life. So this question is for both of you. How can the church play an important role in the healing and growth process for members and leaders who are walking through hardship? How, how can a church come alongside hurting people and be helpful? Great question. And if I take this one first, um, to piggyback off of the last question as well, I think there's this beautiful truth that men and women process things so differently, especially in this area of trials. And the Lord gives us the grace of the local church that we have experiences of other people who have gone before us to draw from. You know, as Mason's sharing, just the process of learning how to deal with your spouse or a friend or a family member who's going through a hard time, it's never a simple formula. You know, you're learning, you're being sanctified. And the local church provides just, again, a beautiful example of the myriad of experiences and trials that the Lord puts together. So one way, you know, that the local church does this is by comforting others as we have been comforted in our affliction by Christ, as scripture talks about. So finding people who have gone before in whatever the trial is, it, it offered great comfort. But a specific way that this was meaningful to me, I can remember, we go to Hurstbourne Baptist Church here in Louisville, I can remember a couple of months after the miscarriage, just being in worship on a Sunday morning and singing the songs, and they were all about Christ. And for a moment, my flesh was frustrated because I wanted something that was going to remind me of my pain. I wanted to sing something to myself. I wanted to be so inward focused because of what I was going through. But the songs were forcing me to think about the glory of this God that I'm serving, even though I don't understand everything he's doing, even though I have a lot of questions for him. It's forcing my eyes back to just the preeminence of Christ. And that's something a local church can do intentionally or not that just is very, very tangible as we're walking through hard times. And so that's something that was a part of our church's ministry to us that was just very comforting to me. Mason, how would you answer the same question? What, how can a church come alongside hurting? Wh whether it's your experience of a miscarriage or a family dealing with cancer or a, a, a child on a autism spectrum uh, scale and uh, divorce, whatever it might be, how, how can a church be helpful? Well, I think that uh, church leaders should see that their local florist is a co-worker in the ministry. Well, we, we were given flowers, and I mean, it touches all senses i mean you've got your eyes you've got you got the smell i mean it that when when our when our church sent us flowers to our, our home we got a reminder a visual and and we, we got we got a reminder sitting on our kitchen table that our church uh, loves us so if if a church doesn't have a budget for flowers then they then they definitely need to because uh, that is a very real way to to communicate that um, you know, we had a pastor come visit us in our our, our home. Um, I'm not sure if pastoral visits are as as uh, popular as they once were, but you know, I, this is a, a thing for me as I process through uh, through 
about to to go into to ministry at, at some point is it is getting out and visiting people and uh, not staying behind your 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 your, your desk um, you know this past year I I wanted to make that a focus of my preparation and training so I go out with my pastor and and, a, and another a sweet man when we we go every week to go uh, visit people and I, I want that kind of, of training before being launched out uh, and pastors should make that a, a, a thing because that that really does help um, I also had a group of friends from our church who took me to Dave and Buster's. I mean, oh, wow. and we're talking like 40 coins from Dave and Buster's, and that <laughs> did a wonder. I mean, it was a yeah. way to kind of get away from home and go and do something that was just kind of fun. Uh, but it was not just fun, but I knew that they were doing it because they knew I'd had a t- such a such, such a hard time. So, uh, you know, find, find whatever your church members are, are into and then drag them away just to have some time away from from that to get re, refreshed and it communicates love uh, to, to to them so those are just a few things that that our church did that i put in my back pocket to use at 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 some point one experience and and mason the the flowers i mean i, I would have to think that and for, for you as well marina not only was it a great gesture and a reminder of the kindness of your church pointing to the kindness of jesus but also an affirmation of the life of your child, that, that it's a reminder that this is a real grief. And, and we send flowers when folks have had a loss and, and are grieving. Is, was, that, was that the case? Very much so, because it, it affirmed to me, like, this is really happening. I, I hadn't had a lot of tangible things to cling on to. You know, yep. our child wasn't far enough along that we had a gravestone. There's not a lot of tangible things I had to cling to as you're grieving. And you don't realize how important that is yep. as you're grieving the loss of other loved ones. So it was it was really special to have that reminder of acknowledgement and just care and comfort throughout our process. I think we had flowers upstairs, downstairs. I mean, everywhere you look, we had flowers. So it's like we just couldn't get away from from that that visual re, reminder of people's love for us. And Mason, those in-home visits, there's an awkwardness to those. If, if either side that you're on, if you're the one doing the visiting or receiving it, there's an awkwardness to it. And I think in many cases, those who are on the receiving side would almost like to say, I don't want any company. I wish no one would even come by. I'm going to do it because I love my pastor. I love my church. But by the time the visit's over, everyone's glad that we had this visit. It, it, it's ultimately good for all of us. God made us that we need that. So I'm, I'm grateful that's part of your experience. So let's talk about writing a book together. Um, for, for Connie and I, we've been married almost 30 years. I, I can't imagine us writing a book together. You two are still almost newlyweds. You've not been married very long. So what are some of the dynamics of writing a book? Mason, you can start here, of writing a book with your with your spouse. What was that like? Well, I mean, it was a lot easier than you might have have, have thought. Um, it, I, I believe that the book idea was Marina's to to start with, and then um, and she might even had some kind of plan. And then I came back, and so it was it was a kind of a going back and forth of I, I would I would take a take a, a good shot at it and send it to her, knowing that she would graciously uh, check over things and edit, and then she would send the document back to me, and I would extend that same kind of grace to her. So. It, it really was not a was not a point of tension, um, you know. And I, when I think back to to writing the the uh, the, the trip that we took, uh, that was the time that I feel like I really was able to have some time a, a, away from the normal pace of life to write. And so I was, uh, it was both a, a trip to get a good amount of writing and thinking done, but also a time to to minister to my wife too. So. Um, you know, right. That was a really, it was really fun. I mean, I would take care of, we kind of had, had d- 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 divided labor. I'd take care of some things. She would take care of, 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 of others. It was really fun that when we got to the very end, we had a, we had a book that could go on our shelf and, you know, I was at a friend's house and I looked over and I'm like, yeah, I wrote that. Like, yeah, yep. that's just, that was very, very cool, uh, to, to see and to be a part of and know that it wasn't just my thing or her thing, but it was our thing. Um, it, and I, I believe it's really going to help to serve us in, uh, in, in our, in our, our, our ministry, wherever we land up. I think it, I think it will. Marina, for you, what did you learn about yourself or about Mason in the process of writing a book together? You know, and thinking about it, it's just a beautiful analogy of marriage in general. It's a perfect little, um, example of what it's like to mesh two different people's experiences, opinions, 
thoughts, dreams, and you're putting it into pages, you know, it's, it, it was a beautiful thing, of course, challenging because there'd be things he'd write. And I'm like, no, 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 we're not going to include that or vice versa. But it was fun to just mesh our different personalities and our different perspectives and our different study of the text. Obviously we're two very different people. And so having those perspectives, I think was helpful in our own processing, but then in the writing part as well. So it was a fun experience. Well, it's a really good book. So you suggest folks to kind of study through the book of James as they're reading it. I read it like you read a book and, and it, it, it seems to me it would work both ways. The way you recommend is obviously probably the best way, but I, I just read it page by page a little bit each day and really enjoyed your book, loved some of the insights that, that the Lord gave you and feel like it'll be a helpful resource for you all to give out in your ministry and for others as well. So this platform is called Leadership Lessons. I want to talk to you about that as a kind of a final question. Uh, so Marina, uh, you go first, and Mason, I'll ask you the same question. Uh, what's an experience in your life that has shaped your approach to leadership or your understanding of what you think leadership ought to, ought to look like? That's a great question. So... Just thinking about a great leader in my life, I can't help but think of my grandpa. His name was Gerald White, and he was a Kentucky Baptist pastor for 60 years. And he passed away. It was actually in September of last year, so it's been about a year. And um, just remembering his legacy, I have some very poignant stories of when I was a young child. And he, as a pastor, also worked bivocationally as a farmer. So he would take me out and we would work on the tractor. Even though I was a young girl, he felt like, you know, that I need to learn how to operate a tractor. So I would help try to figure out how to do different things. And you can just imagine how humorous this was of me trying to figure out how to operate a tractor. Um, and I would say, where does this part go? And his number one piece of advice that he would always tell me, he would say, well, you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. And I would, it would frustrate me because, you know, I wanted some direct leadership from him. I needed him to tell me exactly what he wanted me to do. So that's kind of leadership piece number one of him just exemplifying to be a good leader. You don't have to micromanage. You're just there as someone to inspire, to point others to Christ. He pointed us to Christ so well. He would always be singing a hymn and he had different little sayings and mantras that he would, of course, instill in us as his grandchildren. But then also, I remember another time we were on the tractor, and I was kind of in the corner, and he told me, now, Marina, you keep an eye out behind, because that hay that we're raking, it might catch on fire, because it's been really dry. And I just thought, all right, well, I'll just, you know, sit here. I'm just going to keep an eye out. And sure enough, 10 minutes later, I saw the hay start to spark and there started to be a fire as we were raking. And I, of course, immediately said, Pa, it's on fire. So he stopped and he had a gallon of water already prepared and he poured it on the fire and we just kept on going. Of course, I was scared, but he knew as a leader, he knew what would happen. And he had prepped me and he had trained me up to know what to do. And he had exemplified also how to respond. He had the water ready. So any good leader, you know, they give signs of warning, they give an example, or they give a teaching, a parable, but then they're also with you when it actually happens to show you how to respond. And I think those were just a few of the examples that he would just teach us in farming. And of course, as a pastor as well, that really set me on a trajectory to think about life, to think about leadership, to think about everything I do from a different perspective. And that, that really inspired who I am today. What a great pastor and leader your, your grandfather was, and thank you for those stories. Mason, what about you? What's the story or experience that has helped shape your understanding of leadership or what Christian leadership ought to, ought to look like? Well, I was about, I think I was around 16, uh, so I was, was in high school, um, I, and I talk about this in our book, too. I had a stutter growing up. I, I still still do, um, and you know, I, I was getting more involved in, in church things, but uh, it was out of the, the blue. I got a Facebook message from my pastor that said, hey, I'm going to be gone in, 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 in three weeks. Do you mind filling in for me? And well, where did where did, did that come from? So I studied for three weeks and I prepared a, a, a sermon and then that, that day came and I did it. And uh and I knew then, like, okay, this is this is something kind of special. I mean, I, I can I can see myself doing this now. I go back and look at those sermon notes, and I can't believe I preached some of the the things that that I did. So, I mean, that's another a whole another thing. Um, but there was something about my my pastor knowing 
uh, that maybe that was uh, the well, not not maybe that it was going to be out of my comfort zone, but he identified that in me early and gave me the opportunity to uh, just kind of threw me in the 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 water there for a little bit and uh, and it, it helped to pay off because it made me to to make it my own and just dig in and figure all, all of those things out. Um, so really, that that identification piece of being able to to see uh, people um, and be able to invest in them early, even though they may not get the the job done the very best, uh, but give them the, those opportunities, and the Lord will use that. And uh, by His patience and by His His grace, they will learn and grow and become better. And I hope that's where I'm at right now. Mason and Marina, thank you so much for joining Leadership Lessons. I'm so proud of both of you and thankful for your life and ministry and getting to watch you grow and your examples and the stories that you've told are just great reminders that God calls regular, ordinary people into places of leadership, and he gives us everything we need to be successful in what he's, what he's called us to do. Thank you for taking the time. Thank you for your book, and I look forward to hearing more from, from both of you, too. Thank you. Thanks.